Um, all right, so ULBD, also called, uh, known as uh, laminotomies or laminectomies. Uh, my disclosures have not changed to my knowledge. Um, so uh, I would like to, I'll start with the ESAG data first uh, and then go through the procedural steps where we hope we can discuss. And then we'll keep it very quiet, as a very short on the literature uh, that we have generated there. Uh, perspective data, uh, so far we have 176 total. Uh, it is, uh, they're mainly males, uh, 63 years old, uh, BMI around 30. Uh, interestingly, I was 42% uh, of, of patients that uh, have laminotomies or endoscopic ones are actually employed. Um, and comorbidities are the, 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 the classical comorbidities. 17% um, uh, use opioids. And this was really interesting to me. When I, when I read, uh, when we signed these patients up, they put in there what they want to return to after surgery. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's, yes, Mark, yes, absolutely. We are going to get totally to this. So, so the interesting thing with this is uh, for the laminotomy patients, all of them almost want to go back to some type of activity that involves motion, so walking, golfing, jogging, biking, and okay, so who signed up a patient <laughs> that wants to play the guitar afterwards? I mean, there was whoever ESHG surgeon has a patient who wants to play the guitar and does a laminotomy for this patient, there's, there's a problem, but we'll... I'm pretty sure you can find that out. Yeah. <laughs> we, will, we will internally sort of check that out. Um, pain duration, that was also crazy. I mean, these patients have been in pain for more than, you know, 46 months before they seek a surgeon and before they have the surgery. Uh, the pain is either episodic or mainly constant, which was very interesting, interesting. And sharp and aching was roughly the same. But I was really blown away that, you know, when it, for a laminotomy, really the patient wants to walk again. Uh, and that was just very, very obvious, like, uh, except for this one guitar player. So. <laughs> Um, and then 14% uh, revisions, which I, I thought was really interesting. Um, and then mainly one, one level, two levels, and three levels is a labor of a love. I mean, it's just, that's just really painful. Um, operative times, we have the EBL was very low. Um, this is another thing that surprised me. 23.9% of our patients enrolled have synovial cysts. Very, very common. I, I really didn't think that was so common. There's some discarnations also there. Uh, most people use epinephrine and irrigation to kind of uh, degrees, dural tear is uh, 13%, so pretty high there. Um, that must be mine. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so again, I did. I took out the patient, the surgeon's name so that nobody gets upset. Um, <laughs> somebody get upset. Um, and then here's the data. So uh, back pain, uh, pre-op was uh, 5.7 at uh, 12 months is 3.2. Uh, Leg like pain, 5.3, goes also down to 2.3. ODI from 13, 17 down to 12. Um, and this is really the cool data here right now. So the stepping data, we're collecting uh, continuous monitoring on these patients. And so you have really three type of patients. Uh, one type of patient, the superstars, the super walkers that really take off and they walk two to three times as much than before surgery. And then the patients that walk more, and then you have the sluggers that, uh, you know, really, uh, <laughs> really never kind of recover there. And it's, it's actually quite a big patient population that doesn't walk as much. Again, I just pulled these data. And um, I think we really have to look into this. And, you know, given that the patients really want to walk, us looking at proms is kind of stupid. So um, I think, you know, me just looking through the SIG data opened my eyes. I think we really have to, and there's, there's tests like, you know, the 10 second sort of walking test where you have out of sitting walking. I think we have to revise our proms for these because I mean, this is, we have to find out what's going on with these guys. Why are they not walking, right? At the very least, it looks like they get back to their baseline. Sorry, one more time. It's like it's at the very least, it looks like they get back to their baseline. The sluggers. It seems like after surgery, they improve for a little bit, maybe up to four months, and then they just go back to what they were doing before, which it, might be the cause of their back pain in the first place. It could be. It's, it's going. To be, I think you know the next. This is obviously papers. So we have to pull these patients out and sort of see what's going on. What the character. I mean, it would be nice to identify them. Maybe they need more different surgery. But it's it's this is crazy, right? That there's such. Or maybe some of them were already walking more than average. So. You know, maybe walking wasn't their big problem, and they were already walking okay, and so they're still walking okay. Yep. No. I think there's a lot of good data in there. So, um, 
So let's talk about the surgical technique uh, a little bit, um, and we'll talk much more about this tomorrow. There's obviously different endoscopes that we can use here, a lot of them out there. And again, big thank you for the industry support here. Um, it is really, uh, hemostasis is one of the most important things in this procedure, um, because if you've all seen this, you take the kerosene bite, and afterwards this starts, and then everything turns red. Um, and then you want to stop that. Another thing is, you know, monopolar devices, and there's more and more sort of technology coming that way. I use a normal Bobby Carway, uh, which works, uh, but there's obviously much better developed uh, stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, we'll talk in, the, in detail tomorrow about the kerosens and the different um, drill systems or the shaver systems. Um, and then here's the technique. Uh, so before, um, you know, uh, select your case, you know, I think it's really important to kind of look first, you know, how much yellow ligament are you going to have? How large is that yellow ligament? Not only to plan what type of instruments you use, but also what, what you expect to uh, retrieve. And also pay attention to this little V-shaped uh, dura back there, where it's easy to get into the dura and do a dural tear. Um, thickness of the lamina, you know, if it's a very thick lamina, you have to drill much more, it's much more time consuming. Uh, and tomorrow we have a really nice session on that, how to, how to do that the best. Um, Sock wrote a really nice paper on the impact of scoliosis. Uh, what the main issue there is like, you know, just pay attention to the facet joint. If you start doing these cases and you have an overgrown facet joint like this, this can be difficult to land there. And it just takes the time to find the, uh, find your bearing there. So especially at the beginning, this can be, uh, is really helpful to look at the preoperative MI so that you know what you get yourself into. Um, I think this is the most important thing is for the, for the novice, for the training to get the incision right. Um, uh, we like to do an end plate view first, then tilt the CM caudally, so then you can see the spinous process is moving, more centered, tilt even more, and then they're completely centered. Uh, what this does is really minimizes the amount of drilling you have to do. Uh, if you do this well, it can shave off a half an hour easily from the procedure. Uh, because if you do an incision over here higher, then you can't go to the contralateral side because the spinal process is in your way. So this is really, really important. Um, and the interesting thing is like, it's not only important for endoscopic surgery, it's also important for MIS and open LAMIs. Uh, this is another thing is that uh, the, the, the trick is the drilling is uh, really done along the yellow ligament attachment. Once you've found the yellow ligament attachment and you follow this along, you, you don't only decompress, but also sort of, uh, you also um, remove the yellow ligament, detach it along the attachment. And so the bony decompression goes hand in hand uh, with the detachment of the yellow ligament. Uh, drilling on top of the rostal, edge of the inferior lamina is something that you cannot do MIS. So this is something that is very proprietary to endoscopic stuff. Drilling along this edge with the um, high-speed drill with a tube would be crazy. The dura would be in a drill. You couldn't do that. Uh, if you have everything on the water, the dura is pushed away a little bit, and you can safely drill there. Um, and for that reason, I think the outcomes uh, you know, are pretty good. Uh, flavectomy. Um, is, is great to do on block. Uh, you know, the fewer reaches you have to do, the more you can detach it, the, the faster you are and the safer you are. Uh, and I think this is really important to do a, a appropriate lateral recess decompression. Uh, I really like to find both uh, traversing nerve roots, mobilize them, make sure that they're not pinched anymore. Uh, lateral recess stenosis is, I think, one of the most uh, most missed diagnosis is if you only look at the lateral recess, you can help so many patients because the radiologist doesn't read it, and most most surgeons, um, you know, don't look too carefully there either. Uh, quickly, a little bit of outcome data for the last couple of minutes. Um, so here's an example: a 47-year-old male, six years of history of. Uh, uh, buttock pain, posterior thigh pain, uh, minimal receive, relief of NSAIDs. Uh, here are the uh, VS um, scores, no instability. Uh, we'll skip that video because we'll see that tomorrow. Um, and again, you can see here the typical recovery. Leg pain is gone immediately afterwards, and the back pain takes a little bit more time, as does the ODI. Um, and then this was a study that we published uh, a while ago now, uh, but I think it's really... Yeah, Lynn looks a little bit different there. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think the, the crazy thing about this study was that, you know, we included my first 50 endoscopic cases um, and compared them with my last 45 MIS cases. And 
the surgical times were much longer for endoscopic. You know, there's no question that, and my last slide, I'll show you the latest ESHG data on that, which is really interesting. Um, hospital stay was immediately shorter. And my first endoscopic cases did better than my last MIS cases. So at the beginning of my learning curve, my outcomes were better than the end of my MIS outcome. I, I did thousands of these cases. In fact, my last day of residency, I did three ULB, MIS ULBDs with Roger Hartle. Three, one after the boom, boom, boom. Um, and so um, that is uh, definitely was interesting. Uh, another thing is like really important, uh, you know, obesity. There's uh, is really obesity is huge. There's more and more large patients. And endoscopy really is an obesity neutralizer um, in that obesity has no effect on operative time, functional outcome, and intraoperative complications. You know, you still have the induction time, so you have time for an additional coffee or, or cookie. <laughs> um, the hospital stays are prolonged, and there's medical complications are increased. But but everything that we have impact on or that we can address uh, uh, is neutralized. And then Maddie, who is now with Mark, right? How's she doing? She's um, with other. Was that? <laughs> she's not your kick. She's, oh she's not my, my no, fellow. No, no. <laughs> Immediately turfing her. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry, Maddie. Um, so we um, put together a little study there. Is, uh, and uh, again, if you have durotomies, again, in the code, uh, 13%, mainly mine probably. Uh, but if you repair uh, this, wait a moment. So durotomies is here 7.5%. Uh, so maybe it's not my percentage. Um, so 7.5% um, 7, 7 with uh, durotomies. But if you do an inlay graft and reinforce it with um, the seal, then the outcomes are the same. So uh, that seems to be uh, a good strategy. Here's the data that we already saw there. Again, uh, I'm not going to repeat that again, but really nice uh, relief of back pain, of leg pain immediately afterwards. Um, and again, the difference between uh, discectomies and laminotomies in, in, in recovery um, the first uh, couple of days. And this was really interesting. So uh, blotting the ESRG data, even within the ESRG, there's still a slow learning curve here right now, guys. So uh, these are the operative times for ULBDs. Uh, and you can see that we're really trending down here right now. Uh, I don't know what these cases down there, maybe somebody gave up on some cases, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't clean that data too much, but 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 it's there's, there's certainly a trend in there. That's a nice thing is when you have hundreds and hundreds of, of data points, you really get very powerful data. Anyhow, that gets us to the conclusion here right now. Um, it's uh, this efficient uh, opportunity for decompressing the spinal canal. There's favorable outcomes, uh, minimizing complications, uh, and there is surgical innovations here uh, to facilitate the learning curve and the efficiency. So thank you so much.